So, okay, just testing to see if it's working. So, uh, without further ado, now we have, uh, well, I wouldn't say a full room, but it's quite nice to see you. So, first of all, I want to say good morning to everyone, and I want to welcome you to Porto. Uh, we hopefully will have good weather uh, during the week, so it's good to have sunny, greeny Porto in here. And it's uh, a pleasure for me to have you receiving you physically, right? So I think we are all fed up with online talks. But uh, th this is not detracting from anybody who's listening to us online, okay? But uh, we made a big effort to actually bring you here physically. Uh, although I should say on a side note, never try to organize hybrid conferences. So it's not just double the work, it's quadruple. So um, I'm also going to say that I probably exchanged messages with some of you. Okay, so my name is Pedro Ribeiro, so I'm the one to blame when it took too long to answer you, but also I'm the one that answered you actually, so it's not too bad, hopefully. Okay, so feel free to ask any questions. We'll have volunteers during the entire week. I would uh, encourage you, if you didn't do it beforehand, to actually register at Slack, which it's a platform for instant messaging. Most of you would actually know it, and you can use Slack to contact myself, to contact the speakers, to contact others, and it's also a place where you can ask questions for anything that you would like to do. And so uh, on this day, we are going to start with a school. So the school is made by a set of tutorials. And the organizer of the school, Sofia Teixeira, unfortunately, she had a medical emergency. She had a, a urgent surgery that actually went well. It was yesterday. And the first thing that she did after the surgery was send me a message at 4 a.m. saying, Pedro, I'm OK, I'm alive. Please, everything go well with the school. And I just wanted that she wanted to let you know that she wishes also you well. And she was the one responsible for inviting Eugenio, Martin, and everyone else. So it's a pity we don't have it, but we can see some of the fruits of her work today. So I don't want to spend much time speaking about myself. We'll have the actual, let's say, more formal opening tomorrow of the conference. Okay, so we'll speak a bit about uh, yourselves, uh, some data from the registration. What I want to introduce now is the first speaker for today, which is going to be Eugenio Valdano. And um, he's from the Pierre Louis, um, I, let's see my, how my French is. I mean, uh, it's in the, actually in English, Institute of Epidemiology. It's, it's, I should read it in French, because je parle un peu de français. La Sorbonne Université. I think all Portuguese people know how to speak a bit of French, probably my parents. And also, as we say, if you have, if you have any Spanish-speaking persons, I actually tend to say that Portuguese people also speak Portuñol, which is a mix between Spanish and, and French. And um, he's going to give us a talk, which I believe it's very interesting. So it couldn't be a much more accurate and interesting subject nowadays, which is using networks to study the spread of infectious disease epidemics. And um, I'm going to leave the floor to him, but Eugene is going to tell you, but feel free, because it's more like a tutorial-like, feel free to actually ask questions if you want during the talk. That's what Eugene told me, right? And so the idea is that we engage in, in hopefully uh, interesting discussions. And without further ado, Eugene, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you very much. I'm going to just um move this uh yeah first of all let me really thank the organizers for inviting me and a special thank i i will join him in uh, thanking sofia uh, it's really a pity that she couldn't be here but uh, um i hope she gets well soon i mean uh, she also sent me a message said that everything was fine so uh yeah um many thanks to her uh i'm very happy to be here for so many reasons uh because uh, it's gonna be a great conference because it's uh, it's finally in person because it's my first time in Portugal because in Paris the weather was completely shitty and I arrived here <laughs> and it's 20 degrees so I'm really I'm really really happy to be here. Um, as you said, uh, I would like this uh, to be informal in a sense that I have prepared. Uh, a lot of contents for you guys today, uh, but uh, I want to adjust it also given your interest. And uh, it's, it's especially important that if uh, I'm going too fast on something and, and it's not clear, uh, just please go ahead and stop me, ask me questions. Uh, don't think of it like a, a talk when I just present my, my work, but more like, a, yeah, a tutorial, a lecture, whatever. Uh, but let's, um, let's start. Uh, shall we? So um, basically, 
um, what the, I am a, an infectious disease epidemiologist, so my, my, my job is to, uh, to study how infectious diseases spread in populations. Uh, and of course, I focused uh, uh, this tutorial on networks, uh, given the conference we are, we're at. Uh, but it's, uh, it's not difficult because networks really emerge naturally in the context of uh, infectious diseases. Um, and the, 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 the first thing we think of when we think of network and infectious diseases is that the fact that, that infectious diseases spread from person to person. So they need, you know, contacts along which they spread. And this naturally uh, translates into nodes being the potential hosts and link being the potential routes of transmissions. Um, but it's not, I mean, it's, it, it's not just that. Networks are more pervasive. And I, um, and I want to start by thinking on the, of the fact that no, not all diseases uh, are spread through direct contacts and, and need to, networks are still relevant. So I just wanted to, you know, warm ourselves up a bit like shooting uh, some names of diseases. So um, I, I would like to ask you uh, if you can think of some infectious diseases that are spread through direct contacts. <laughs> I, I guess you, you have, you can guess one, right? Uh, can you give me others? It's very simple. I just go ahead. Yeah, yeah. HIV, HIV for example, um, which are very, contacts that are different from uh, the one you were thinking of, which is COVID, which is face to face contacts. HIV is um, mostly sexual contacts. Uh, of course, you have other diseases, which uh, are like influ influenza, which is also airborne, uh, and other sexually transmitted diseases, etc. Um, do you guys know uh, what vector-borne diseases are? Exactly, uh, mostly insects. So uh, we think of like mosquitoes, mosquito bites me and then bites you and it transmits the disease that I used to have. Can you get, give me some names of vector-borne diseases? Speak up. Malaria. Malaria, for example, which is mosquitoes. Uh, can you think of any other vectors which are not mosquitoes? Rats. Sort of, yeah, for example, the plague, the plague goes from rats to humans, but it actually goes through um, to ticks, to uh, the flies. No, what's the name in English? Like, um, please, please. please. Um, bird? That's actually not a vector, but it's more like a cross species direct transmissions when a human gets it from uh, the, the bird and then it, it may jump to other species. Uh, a vector, it's really someone that uh, it's, it's, not, it's not just once in a while. It's really the dynamic of the disease. It's, it really requires the vector and the human, like malaria, for example, you have the parasite cycle in the mosquito and the parasite cycle in the human. For example, I think toxoplasmosis. Maybe that's also direct from uh, from from human to animals. Yeah, that's also it, it, it's a bit different because in the sense that um, direct transmissions from human to animal it's different than vector in the sense that um, then the disease can also mutate and jump to, from human to human or from animal to animal. Uh, two mosquitoes are not able to transmit malaria across themselves and to humans are not able to transmit malaria across themselves. That's not the case, for example, for flu or other diseases like toxoplasmosis. It's really like uh, a cycle that requires the two. Uh, finally, uh, there are another class of infectious diseases, which we're not going to uh, stay too much on them in this talk, but it's nice to mention them, which are all diseases that are transmitted uh, due to exposure to an environment or to some, some contaminated food water through some fomites, which can be, for example, like I pass this bottle to someone and they touch it and they get the disease, etc. Finally, can you give me some, uh, some names of diseases which are spread in this way through contaminated food, for example, contaminated water? Okay. Cholera, hepatitis, exactly. I mean, you, you guys are very good, it's probably <laughs> useless <laughs> to, but okay. I, I think we most co covered most of them. Um, so 
as I said, networks will appear, of course, it's, it's easy to see them in directly transmitted diseases. Uh, they will also appear in vector-borne diseases. We will see about that. Uh, we're gonna, not going to talk about the third class, but if you get creative, you actually uh, also get networks in this case. For example, people study uh, water transportation networks for cholera, etc. As I said, it's easy for, uh, for, can I do the thing also here? Yeah, sorry. Uh, for directly transmitted diseases, here what you have is a network of face-to-face -face contacts in a hospital ward. Uh, here you see contacts that evolve in time between doctors, nurses, patients, etc. This is not a model, this is actually recorded contacts, uh, the social pattern collaborations. They, uh, they had people wear some radio frequency tags which could detect when people were in, in close proximity. So you, these are the contacts that happen in that hospital ward at that particular time. And of course, you can imagine how many diseases could spread uh, through this face-to-face um, -face contact, and we'll get back to that. But as I said, networks emerge also for vector-borne diseases, and this is mo uh, often, if not mostly, related to the fact that um, you can study the mobility networks of people, because imagine that I live in place A, but I go to work in place B, uh, so I spend some time every day in place B, and place B has a lot of mosquitoes, and these mosquitoes have a high prevalence of a particular parasite or virus, etc. And so, of course, my spending time outside of home makes me at risk of contracting the disease. And for example, people they did great work on studying how mobility impacted the, the spread of malaria. This is in Kenya, but they did it also in other African countries. Finally, uh, I, I just want to flash. Uh, I think that I'm not going to talk about it uh, anymore, but uh, when you think about diseases and networks, you're thinking about uh, the networks of, of contacts or mobility through which potentially the, the disease uh, spreads. There are other types of network which are contact um, uh, transmission chains. So uh, these networks are not co uh, contacts through which the disease could spread, but mark who infected whom. Uh, and people, uh, epidemiologists, often go there in the field and try to reconstruct these contacts, these um, transmission chains, either through like interviewing people or uh, sampling the genome of the pathogen and reconstructing the, the most likely transmission chain, looking at uh, genomic similarities between uh, the pathogen sampled in the different people. And these uh, contact tracing, these transmission chains are useful, uh, very useful, for example, to measure uh, unknown epidemiological parameters of the disease, like the generation time, which is the time occurring between me getting infected and me infecting someone else. These are key epidemiological parameters that you need to know a disease and to model a disease, and, uh, and these kind of networks are very useful. Uh, but, as I said, let's go back to the networks that can spread diseases, which will be the main topic of our talk. And before doing that, um, let's actually forget about networks and do a little bit of, um, of math, uh, look a little bit of introduction on how diseases are actually modeled. Because disease, uh, infectious disease modeling and epidemic modeling predates network science. Um, it's not that like uh, nobody was doing it before networks. It's, it's actually a very, um, a very ancient, not ancient, but at least uh, centuries old field. And we're gonna start, again, stop me if now we're gonna get more technical. So if something's not clear, please stop me. We're going to start from these equations, which probably many of you already saw, but um, this is a, a standard way to model an epidemic. Uh, so you have uh, three variables, I have to do it like this, three variables over here, which is S of T, which is the number of people at time T who are susceptible to the infection, so can actually get infected. Uh, I of T is the number of people at time T who are infected and infectious so that can transmit the disease. And finally, R of T is um, the number of people who uh, used to be infected, now recovered, and are immune to the disease. And we are assuming, for simplicity, a constant population of size N 
uh, it's not a requirement. You can do a, a variable population, but uh, we're gonna stick with fixed population. So here you have this, I mean, they're very simple equations because they relate the change in time of these three quantities, so their first derivative, to uh, some um, key terms. Uh, the first one, uh, le let's examine the, 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 the equation for the number of infected. The other ones are basically like more of the same uh, for consistency. But um, so the first term, uh, the, the purple one, uh, it's actually, uh, it's a simple like decay rate because people recover at a rate mu in time. And so of course the number of infected individual decreases uh, with this rate and it's proportional to how many infected you have. And then you have a second term, which is, uh, let's say, a little bit more complicated, um, which is actually the infection term. And here it's, it's, a, it's a quadratic term because you have susceptible times infected. And here you have, we're gonna examine this term, but you have the transmission rate lambda, then K is the average number of contacts that a person makes, uh, and this will, be like basically the origin from, from to which we will put networks later. Uh, then, of course, you have the number of susceptibles because the more susceptible people you have, the more people can get infected. And then I over N is the probability that the person you are in contact with, it, it's actually infectious, so you can get the disease from. So if you solve these equations, um, this is what you get. So here you have, the evolution of these three quantities, S, I, R, in time. And you can get a nice epidemic wave, uh, which uh, many of you probably saw, which is the red curve here, which is the number of infected in time. It goes up, and then at some point it goes down, and the epidemic dies out. Let's examine um, this epidemic evolution, right? Uh, let's focus at the, uh, first on the... Um, early stage of the outbreak. So at the beginning when you have maybe, you have a fully susceptible population, so people who can actually get infected, and you have an infected person coming into the population, what's gonna happen? Well, typically you can simplify, at the early stage of the epidemic, you, you can simplify the equation that we saw before, uh, assuming that basically everybody is susceptible. Uh, and so you actually have this time a linear differential equation, which is very easy to solve. Um, and you get an exponential growth of infected. And <laughs> probably, I mean, I, I know that I'm saying things that probably people, uh, even those among you who did not, don't work on epidemiology have heard for the past two, two years, like exponential growth, the reproductive number. But I think it's, I don't know, I mean, if it's obvious for any of you, we can skip it, but I think it's beneficial also to, to go back to the basics and see how these things emerge. So if you linearize these equations, you get an epidemic growth and the epidemic growth, um, it's actually uh, moderated, it's, uh, it's, um, it's tuned by this important uh, parameter, which is the basic reproductive number R0, which is defined as the average number of secondary cases that a case generates in a fully susceptible population. So you guys are all susceptible to the disease. I come in, I have a disease, how many cases will I generate? Um, in this very simple formalism that I introduced, the formula for R0 is K uh, times transmission rate over recovery rate. And it's easy to, um, to understand why, because one over mu, mu being the recovery rate. So one over mu is the average time that I stay infectious. So the time I have to infect people times the aver the, the co my contact rate. So how many people I'm meeting times the rate I, in, at which I infect these contacts. This gives me R0. And if you solve the equations as before, you can see that in the exponential growth, you have R0 minus one. This means that if R0 is larger than one, then the exponent is larger than zero, and then you have an, epidemic, uh, an exponential growth, which makes sense because if every case generates more than themselves, then you have an exponential generation, it's like, uh, a, a birth process. On the contrary, if R0 is less than one, then the exponent is uh, negative, and so you have a, an epidemic decrease, and the, you, you don't have an outbreak, basically. You have an infectious, you have few infected, then they recover, and that's it. So we can see that R0 equal one is this critical value 
which defines a very important concept in epidemiology, which is the epidemic threshold, which is the critical transmissibility value. Why is it cancel? I don't know. Uh, ah, maybe because I have to, whatever. It's the critical transmissibility value above which the epidemic breaks out. So if you put R0 equal to 1, you get this lambda C, critical transmissibility, which is mu over, over K, the number of contacts. If lambda, the, the true transmissibility of your disease is higher than that, you have an epidemic outbreak, uh, which, is mean, which means R0 larger than 1. Instead, you have extinction. So um, that's for the early stage of the epidemic. Let's focus now on the final stage of the epidemic. Look at this important uh, thing here. So the gray curve is the number of recovered people in time. So if you go at infinite time, you have the final attack rate of the disease. So how many, what's the fraction of your population that the disease was able to get? Naively, you could think of, okay, if the, the epidemic takes off, it's gonna infect, at some point, it's gonna infect everybody. But if you look at the asymptotic value of R, it's not actually one, it's less than one. Some never got infected, even if you actually had an epidemic um, wave. So you recover back the epidemic threshold in this way. If you look at the final attack rate, so the, the final size of your epidemic as a function of R0, uh, you can actually analytically derive it. Uh, if you take the equations, you can derive this, uh, this equation for the final attack rate. You can see that uh, below the epidemic threshold, so the critical transmission value, so R0 equal to one, the final attack rate is zero. Then it's not like um, a, a, a jump, like from zero to one, but you start having an attack rate that grows. And of course, when R0, when the transmissibility of your disease is very large, it's gonna get almost everybody. But it's important to see that the final attack rate is not one simply because at some point, the disease has infected so many people that it doesn't have enough susceptibles around to sustain transmission, and so it's gonna stop. Uh, to do <laughs> some name dropping, but uh, not kidding, but if, like for physicists inside, you can frame all these things in terms of uh, phase transitions, because of course you have this critical value trans uh, epidemic threshold, and you have a macroscopic uh, behavior which is radically different when you are below the epidemic threshold and above the epidemic threshold. Um, compartmental models, I, I used it without introducing it uh, in the sense that I talk about susceptibles, S, infected, I, recovered, R. This is a compartmental model. Uh, compartmental models are the standard way to model uh, not only diseases, but also, so, Okay, they are the standard way to model disease natural history, so how diseases progress. Uh, and you assume that in the, an individual at each point in time is in one of mutu some mutually exclusive sets of states, these compartments, susceptible, infected, uh, recovered. And then you have some epidemic dynamic which tells you how uh, the state, the compartment of each individual changes over time. SIR is one of them, you have others. One very uh, important one, which we are gonna use a lot, is the SIS, which assumes that once you recover, you, you acquire no immunity, and so you go back to being susceptible. Uh, then you can, of, of course, make them as complex as you like. For example, some, uh, and a very important parameter is, uh, the uh, very important compartment is this yellow one, the exposed compartment, which basically models the fact that when I get infected, there's a time in which I am infected, but I'm not yet infectious. It's called latency period. And at a certain point, I then become infected. For example, COVID has this, uh, the Omicron variant shortened the latency period. So the time it takes for me from infection to become infectious is, yeah. Uh, speak, speak up. You can have, you can, um, you can model in different way. For example, you can have uh, a different, comp the same, you can duplicate all the compartments 
for the different strains, if you have like some sort of phenotypes, of course, so regardless of the specific mutations, you have one strain that is susceptible to an antiviral and the other strain which is resistant to the antiviral, then you have all the compartments, they are split in two, and then you have some transitions that go from one to the other. But a point that I, that I wanna make is that when people say that um, compartmental model model disease natural history, so each disease has a specific compartmental model. This is actually not true because uh, you are a modeler, so the model assumptions are important. The same disease can be modeled uh, with different compartmental models depending on what are the goals, what are the things that you want to find. More complex compartmental model, of course, they're gonna be more realistic uh, of the actual disease natural history, but you have to parameterize them, and these parameters are hard to get. So sometimes a simpler model, it's actually more robust. So for example, to talk about, of course, COVID, uh, is SIR a good model for COVID? I mean, maybe on short time scales, yes. Of course, you are forgetting latency, so you might want to have latency, but then you could also add an age structure. So people of different ages, which you can put that. In my point being, uh, the choice of the compartmental model is really depending on the science, the, 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 the scientific question or the public health question that we want to, to answer. And compartmental models can be as simple like the SIR or the SIS uh, or as complex as, as can be. For example, here you have uh, a, a compartmental model for, uh, for COVID, which, I mean, it's not that complex in the end. Uh, then, for example, HIV models can be as simple as an SIS or as complex as having 30 compartments which every stage of the infection and you have these pages of pages of supplementary material with the, with the equations. You can find really everything. Of course, in this, in this lecture, we're gonna use very simple models because we want to talk about general things and we want to derive some general properties. Um, and that being said, let's, we examine the SIR, let's, quickly examine the SIS because we are gonna use it and it's very similar because uh, for example, here you have, uh, yeah, I, I pasted that the, R, the, the R, the legend for R, but clearly there are no R's. <laughs> but uh, as you can see, the, basically the, the equations for the infected is the same because uh, you recover and then you, you can get infected with the, with the mass term. By the way, these equations are the same as chemical reactions. Uh, they are called reaction diffusion processes. Um, they emerge from physics, from uh, physical chemistry, etc., and they are so simple, but they actually work very well also in epidemiology. And it's, these are not these are not toy models; these are simple models, but they actually they are actually used. Um, but anyway, so the, the the SIM model it's even simpler because it has one less equation. The terms are exactly the same. This is what solving these equations look like. So of course, you don't have an epidemic wave because you have no recovered, but you have an equilibrium point in which the number of infections and the number of recoveries balance out. And so you have a fixed uh, prevalence in the population. So a fixed number, fraction of people infected, which is uh, the point in which the disease reaches endemicity. So it's an endemic state. Uh, and again, you can um, define an epidemic threshold for the SIS model, and this time your control parameter, it's not the finite outbreak size, but it's the uh, endemic prevalence. So the fraction of people that are asymptotically infected, it's gonna be zero below the epidemic threshold, which by the way, it's the same as the SIS, and non-zero uh, above the epidemic threshold. Now, I just want to, as I said, these models, uh, they work well, they are, uh, they are used, but I just don't want to now see, uh, I don't want you to see epidemic curves like, like that everywhere. Uh, this is the number of COVID hospitalizations in the region of Paris uh, since the start of the epidemic. I use the hospitalizations simply because they are more reliable that, uh, that cases, because cases were not tested at the beginning, et cetera. So let's assume and it, it's fine that these are actually like proportional to the number of cases. Uh, so you can see, for example, let's look at the first wave. Like you have a nice epidemic curve, initial uh, exponential growth, then at some point you have a maximum and then it dies out. And 
I mean, with different changes, you have other waves uh, which were the known uh, waves. The, the second one was uh, late 2020, then you had the alpha variant, then you had the delta variant, and now you have the Omicron variant. My question is, uh, as, as I said for the SIR model, at some point the epidemic dies out because you don't have susceptibles, right? So this is called depletion of susceptibles. Uh, you infect so many people that at some point, even if there are few susceptibles, uh, the, 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 the reproductive number at that point is not high enough, so the epidemic dies out. My question is, is this what happened in the first wave of COVID in France? Was this epidemic dying out due to the depletion of susceptibles? So the answer is clearly no, because um, basically if you look at the, uh, there were some measures of seroprevalence in uh, May uh, 2020 seroprevalence is the fraction of people who have antibody for a specific disease. That at that time, I mean, if you do it now, it does, it, it, it's not a measure of attack rate because most of the people are vaccinated. But if you did it at that point, it was a good measure of attack rate. People who have antibodies, you assume that are those who got infected. And after the first wave, it was 10%. It meant that 10% of the people were infected. Is this the final attack rate that you would expect from an SIR model? No, because if you, if you take the uh, basic reproductive number of the historical wild type uh, COVID, it was around three. And so if you take, this, this is basically the, the plot that I showed you at the beginning for the final attack rate of the SIR, it would, you would need, you would have an attack rate of more than 90% with that R0, which was very high. But here you have 10%. So this is very simple and obvious a posteriori, but I just want to make a point that you rarely see, luckily, in reality, that depletion of susceptibles because it would be crazy. It's like you have an epidemic ravaging, you do absolutely nothing, you change nothing, at some point it's gonna, uh, it's gonna stop. But what actually happened, as you know, was, well, a lockdown. So be careful in interpreting epidemic curves because the, the actual die out here was because the contact patterns changed. Otherwise, that, that curve would have at some point saturated, but I, I cannot go up with the, with the red dot. It would have been, I don't know, 10 times higher. So it, it's just like, um, and I think at, especially at the beginning, some people actually even said that, that it's like, yeah, I died out because, not because we did something, but because epidemics at some point they do. Yeah, at some point they do, but uh, with people on the streets instead of in the hospitals, just saying. Um, I mentioned vaccinations. Let's, uh, let's put a simple model for vaccinations uh, in, in, in this uh, SIS, which again, it's, it's important to see some things that a lot of people talked about in these years, but uh, I think that even from the, you know, from the physical point of view, they generate very interesting dynamics. So, it's very easy to put vaccinations if you think about it. You have these uh, SIS model equations. It's the ones that I just showed you with the, for uh, the evolution of the infected individuals. Uh, and then you assume that instead of having the, the number of susceptibles, it's total number of people minus those infected. It's total number of people minus those infected minus a number of V of vaccinated that you have in the population, right? Uh, I'm going to ref uh, just rephrase this equation once because then also for networks it's more uh, it's easy to talk about uh, fractions instead of numbers so we're gonna because we're always assuming here steady population so I'm gonna introduce this variable x of t which is exactly like n of t but divided by n so x of t is the fraction of people in your population that are actually infected very simple and and v uh, small case, it's actually num the vaccination coverage. So if it's 30%, mean meaning that, uh, so 0 0.3, it's 30% of your population is vaccinated. So I'm gonna just rewrite this equation in terms of fractions. And so here you have the evolution of the, num the fraction of infected, but it's exactly the same thing. So then you ask yourself the question, uh, what is the vaccination coverage that you need to prevent the outbreak? Naively, you would say, okay, let's just vaccinate everyone. If I vaccinate everyone and 
this is crucial like for these things. I assume that I have a vaccine that prevents infection like with 100% efficacy. Uh, for example, we can think about, um, that's, that's what happened with smallpox. You had a very, effect, very effective vaccine that prevented infection. Uh, so basically people who were vaccinated did not get uh, smallpox and could not spread smallpox onward. So if you have a vaccine like that and you ask yourself, how many people do I have to vaccinate? Uh, you just to take the exponent that we saw at the beginning that this time will have a vaccination term and you put and you say that this exponent has to be less than zero. And you find that uh, the fraction of people that you have to vaccinate depends on the R0 of the disease like this. But crucially, this critical vaccination rate is less than one. And this is what it's called herd immunity, which is again another buzzword these days, which means that if I vaccinate, if I vaccinate enough people, even if I don't vaccinate everyone, there are so few susceptibles around that the effective reproductive number of my disease is not above one because uh, the disease itself could get like out of one uh, infected could get maybe three infected but um, some of the people that the case is in contact with are actually immune to, thanks to the vaccine and so it's not able to sustain an epidemic outbreak for example if with an r0 equal to three if you had a completely sterilizing vaccine then you would need basically to vaccinate just two-thirds of the population to avoid the outbreak instead of one and this is a, i mean it's it's a very uh well known and established fact but i think it's very interesting to see uh this uh, this uh, this power of vaccines that explains exactly as i said the fact that we eradicated smallpox as humanity we could eradicate it because we had a vaccine that uh, was very effective and we didn't need to vaccinate everybody vaccination campaigns were successful but you never can reach like everybody but if you reach a high enough threshold then the game is done plus there are also other factors that i'm just mentioning for for knowledge the fact that smallpox didn't have an animal reservoir so talking again about the uh, transmission back and forth from animals if you have an animal reservoir that's you will have to keep vaccinating all the newborns because otherwise the, the virus or the other pathogen will stay in the animal reservoir and then if new people are born without and don't have the vaccine it's going to infect them it's more, yeah So measles, the vaccine works also very well, but then I guess you get pockets of um, in, uh, sensitive uh, people, and then the vaccine, the, the disease keeps on going. Exactly, and and that's that's actually uh, uh, that's actually as I was saying, due to the fact that, that um, new people are born and are not yet immune. I mean, uh, first of all, R zero of measles is huge. It's like around twelve. So. In theory, like the herd immunity, it's basically one. So to, 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 um, to eradicate measles, even uh, if you could, you would need, uh, I mean, basically to vaccinate like everybody all the time. Um, so as long as you have some newborns not being vaccinated, they're gonna get the disease. And the R0 is so large that once someone gets it in a class, everybody who is not vaccinated will get it. No, I don't think it has hope of eradication, but there's hope of control. Because, uh, uh, I mean, honestly, um, with vaccines and in, with, for, for example, measles, yeah, it's, I mean, uh, it's, it can be very serious w when you don't vaccinate. But it's not, uh, if vaccinations were like thorough, it wouldn't be a public health problem, but it's not going to be eradicated, if that's what you are. One disease, which is close to be eradicated is polio, thanks to vaccines. Again, because it doesn't have an animal reservoir. So polio cases are now just basically appearing in just few countries which haven't reached this herd immunity yet. Uh, like I think Pakistan, Afghanistan, some places in Africa, but we are in the progress of reaching that. 
because the R0 is, is less. But when you have R0 of measles, it's, it's basically you need to vaccinate everyone. Um, Eugenia, yeah. can I just ask you to, sure. if somebody makes a small remark, if you can yeah. repeat it so that people online can hear it. Okay, so, so that when somebody says ABC, just say ABC so that people online can hear, okay? A, a, when, when somebody asks you a ah, question, sorry, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I, good I will point. try to get the microphone. No, 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 good point, longer, good point. But instead of giving, you know, I didn't think you know, about that. No worries. Okay? Yeah. I'm just telling because without microphones, we listen. Better. Makes sense. Okay. <laughs> just hear the but answers, but I don't know what the question. We have microphones in here and also over there. Okay, just ask and. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. But if I should I forget, just remind me immediately. No so worries. That, I, I'm, not... I'm using the chats to keep people informed. Um, so I think it's time actually to plug networks into this game. Uh, I think we had some uh, strong basics now. Uh, and the rationale be behind putting networks is that uh, so far we implicitly assumed what's called homogeneous mixing. So I had this parameter K, which is the average number of contacts that a person makes. And basically I am assuming that everyone has the same contact rate, okay? And whenever this person makes contacts, they make it with random people in the population. So if your population is uh, this conference, then everybody is as popular as everybody else. Uh, and everybody makes random contacts with everybody. Uh, but it's not about popularity also, it's possible if my uh, my lecture was uh, uh, some uh, i don't know interesting that after this talk i'm gonna have more people than average talking to me because maybe they have questions so i won't have the same contact rate as uh, uh, a guy maybe who just arrived and uh, and they were late for the conference but again i'm not saying that like what we did was wrong and now we plug networks because those models are very robust sometimes even now, people use it to model huge, uh, like whole cities, assuming homogeneous mixing. And that's, th that's fine in certain contexts. Uh, also, maybe you don't have information on contact patterns. And, and again, simple models are generally good because they, they, they provide you with a robust findings. So it's, it's not like in epidemic modeling, it's like in every possible science, it's a balance between adding all the details that you need but not more than what you need. Sometimes that is assuming homogeneous mixing is not enough. To rephrase homogeneous mixing in terms of networks, because then we want to extend it, we can think of homogeneous mixing as um, a sequence of random networks where every node has average degree proportional to this contact rate K. And you have a fast network update, so at at every delta t, with delta t very small with respect to the dynamics of the disease, you have a random Erdos-Reni network where every node, where basically every contact has the same probability of happening. And what we, all the, the, the findings that we derived are made implicitly under this assumption, which is called network annealing. Uh, anneal networks are uh, those things where you basically, you know, and you fix some network properties, in this case, the average degree of each node, and then you implicitly average over all possible configurations that respect your constraints. In this case, average degree. But I don't have to, to tell an audience of network scientists that in social networks and in other types of networks, sexual networks, many networks that are relevant to the spread of diseases, not everybody has the same contact rate. Um, so if you assume like a degree distributions with few fluctuations um, around the average degree, the blue one is simply a Poisson distribution, then homogeneous mixing is fine because especially in the large population limit, the fluctuations around the mean are gonna be uh, you can just throw them away and use the expected degree. But if you have a fat-tailed uh, degree distribution, uh, I, I mean, probably all of you know what a degree distribution is. It's uh, basically the degree of a node is the number of contacts that the node has, the number of links, 
uh, and the degree distribution is the statistical distribution of all the degrees in the, in the network. So a fat tail degree distribution means that you have a higher than expected probability of finding very high degree nodes, those that we call hubs. And in that case, when you have this kind of fat tailed degree distributions, heterogeneous degrees all over the networks, then the homogeneous mixing is no longer uh, a viable option. And we have to make things a little bit more complex. So let's go back to our SIS model. On the left, this is um, the SIS equation that I introduced before, with the X, uh, X being the probability, the fraction of infectious nodes, so that the probability that the node is infectious in another way of formulating it. And this time, we assume a certain degree distribution, P of K, and we define X of K, the probability of being infectious given that you have degree K. And we write, and with that formalism, we write down this time a system of equations for X of K, with K being every possible degree in the network. And this time uh, we get, I think that it's very similar uh, to the SIS, but it's a bit more complex because now it's of course a coupled system of equations because in the equation of X of K, you have over here all the other X of M with M being all the possible degrees. Let's analyze, I mean, the, the recovery term, I don't think I have to explain it. This was minus mu X, this is minus mu X of K. Every, every node of every degree can recover. Let's uh, look a little bit on this, uh, this other part. So this is the standard, the, the infection term of the standard SIS. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Is that the case? It is. Uh, so uh, basically, the question was that I was assuming uh, that uh, this annealing was that I was updating, resampling a new network with a constraint every time step with very short time steps. And this is exactly what I'm doing here. So it's the same process. It's called uh, anneal network. Uh, and here, what I assume is that my constraint is not that um, uh, you have and a degree fixed for everyone, but uh, I have different degree classes and the probability that the node belongs to the degree class is sampled from a degree distribution P of K. For example, if I am one node there, at one time step I can have 10,000 contacts, and then at the next time step I can have just five. There's no persistence. So it depends a bit on how you formulate this, but I would, what I would uh, think of is that like, if you have 10,000 contacts, you will have on average always 10,000 contacts, but what's, what's changing is the people you are in contact with, right? So this is annealing. You are not, and, and we will see the opposite example later. You are not fixing a specific network, uh, but you are fixing the property that you are a high degree node. I don't know if, uh, right? So basically, uh, as I was saying, so this is, this is, uh, very simple, uh, probability that I'm susceptible times contact rate, time probability that my contacts is infected times transmission rate. Here in this new uh, approach, I have the sum over all the possible network, uh, degrees in the network. Then the probability I'm susceptible, it's the same. The number of contacts I have, then this is the probability that my contact has degree M times the probability that that contact is infected, etc. So I just want to, uh, this is the simplest, the less, uh, so the, 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 the most, yeah, the simplest with the fewer assumptions way to couple nodes in this network. And it's, it's, it, it's writing the probability that my contact has degree M is M times the degree distribution. And this is just, again, one flash, it is related to the well-known paradox, the fact that my friends have a higher degree that I have, because they, if you think about stubs, then a node with the, with the, with the degree K has K possible 
ways of making a contact time p of k which is the probability of having that degree and you end up with with this this is i mean a, a standard way to treat these uh, heterogeneous degree networks uh, in, which in this case applies to the epidemic model but going to the results uh, let's go back to the epidemic threshold so actually i think i'm very yeah you know, going very slow but anyway um so this is the epidemic whoa, whoa, whoa. this is the epidemic threshold in the homogeneous mixing case uh, i don't know if you remember that at the beginning uh, critical transmissibility rate meaning that the transmissibility is, is above this value then the epidemic will break out and it's proportional to the recovery rate divided by the average number of contacts if you take the equation that i showed before you do the math you get to a new value of the epidemic threshold which is this one this time it's proportional to the first and the second moments of the degree distribution and the moments of the degree distributions uh, I, I guess you know what moments of, of uh, probability distributions are but uh, they are defined as customary is in this way okay you might say yeah so what we have a new formula but it's actually a very interesting implication to this formula and it's let's assume that you have a degree distribution that's a power law so it's the probability of having degree k it's k, uh, proportional to k uh, to the minus gamma with gamma being the exponent of the power law now here in this plot i'm plotting that second moment of this degree distribution as a function of network size if this, this exponent is larger than three, then um, changing the network size doesn't change the uh, second moment that you would expect. It's like a, a Gaussian, a, a Poisson. Of course, like if you measure the empirical moment from a sample from a distribution, you will have fluctuations, but as you increase the sample size, they will converge to a true value. But if this exponent is lower than three, as it's the case of many social uh, and sexual networks, so that they are relevant for the spread of disease, you actually see that the, the second moment increases as the size of the network increases. So in the limit of very large network, you actually have that the second moment of the degree distribution diverges, goes to infinity. And what's the problem? Is that if... Uh, this k square here goes to infinity then the epidemic threshold goes to zero and i remind you that having transmissibility below the epidemic threshold is the only way to, to prevent an outbreak so if the critical value is zero you see very well that for any possible uh, transmissibility value that you have the epidemic will be always in the outbreak phase you will not have the quick extinction phase and this is a, a very well-known uh, fact that was uh, found now many years ago by, uh, independently by Pastor Satoras and Bespignani and with another technique that I'm not showing using generating function by Newman, and provided this very interesting phenomenon of the fact that having uh, hubs, so few nodes with many contacts, they act as super spreaders, making impossible uh, for the disease not to break out and more interestingly, uh, impossible to eradicate up to a point. Let's go back to herd immunity through vaccination. This is the uh, formula that I showed you before, right? So, yeah. Uh, what is the case that for gamma plus three, the Because for gamma plus three, the second moment diverges as well. No, sorry. Yeah, you're right. I should have written below three. Uh, that, that, that was that's a typo thank you for pointing that out it's for gamma below three the second moment diverges for gamma below two even the even the first moment diverges yeah so, so you should read gamma uh, lower than three thank you uh going back to herd immunity uh again you need to vaccinate a fraction that's lower than one to stop the disease in the case of homogeneous mixing in the case of arbitrary p of k if you assume that v, v of k is the probability to be vaccinated given that you have degree k, uh, then to reach herd immunity, this is the equation that you have to solve, where here you have p 
basically um, the expected value of v k square it's the basically related to the correlation between the degree and the probability of being vaccinated if you assume that there's no correlation so that uh, basically the probability that my, my degree doesn't uh, influence the probability of being vaccinated what you get is that you need uh, a vaccination coverage of one so there's no herd immunity that's related to the fact that uh, to the epidemic threshold because if the epidemic threshold is zero the epidemic always breaks out and the only way to stop it is to vaccinate everyone so this contradicts in a sense what we found before and 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 makes us say wow this heterogeneous degree distribution make epidemics more resilient and, and, and more easy uh, harder to eradicate the interesting thing is though is that if you uh, implement targeted vaccination so you assume that those uh, with more contacts are more likely to get vaccinated because you are actually implementing that then you can get in this formula if if uh, if these two things are correlated you can get a herd immunity that's below one so the second main uh, finding uh, of of this uh, like early network science applied to epidemic models is that um, you have a vanishing epidemic threshold for uh, power law distributed uh, degree distributions but if you design a targeted vaccination that depends on the number of contacts so if you vaccinate hubs first then you, you are still able to reach herd immunity that's below 100 percent which is the trivial herd immunity now uh, all this is network annealing which as we uh, as we said is like assuming that you have a fixed degree but it, the, the the actual connection changes over time now this is um what am I doing on time? Because I, I don't want to talk only about this. Maybe I will skip some things. Anyway, um, sometimes that's just not good enough. Here you have the airline transportation network. Of course, there are some uh, airports which have a, a higher degree than other airports, but we cannot assume that they are making random connections with fixed degree because it's like it's not that the New York airport uh, it's connected to one day with the CTA and the day after with CTB. Connections are fixed, so the network uh, the network structure here is fixed in terms not on a degree distribution but of an explicit adjacency matrix AIJ, which is one or some weight if two nodes are connected aij are connecting and zero if they are not connected you can uh, study uh, epidemic uh, spreading on these fixed networks in the case of the sis you can write down uh, again a new equation these times with x of i being the probability that a specific node i is infected um, and you can recover the epidemic threshold and this time is uh, the epidemic threshold is um, depends on and this is a very interesting results on the largest eigenvalue of the adjacency matrix so uh, this again I'm going fast because I don't want to get into the mathematics of this but of course we can talk later if you are interested but to say on one hand we have annealing on the other hand we are assuming this quenched mean field so the net the structure of the network is fixed in terms of an adjacency matrix that tells me who is in contact with whom uh, and then the epidemic threshold these times is uh, a function of the spectral properties of the degree distribution um, but okay so we have these two limiting values uh, in practice network annealing is good is a good approximation when uh, the network the underlying contact network changes faster than the time scale of disease spread of disease evolution on the opposite side if the epidemic spread is faster than a possible network evolution then a quenched structure a fixed structure is what makes more sense what happens when you are in the middle what happens if you are studying a problem in which the structure and the topology of the network evolves with a comparable time scale to that of uh, disease evolution this um, is basically uh, what a, a problem that i wanted to address 
some years ago, uh, which as we will see briefly, it's, it's very relevant in the sense that there are indeed some diseases and some processes in which the two time scales are, are comparable. And the way to solve it is that you basically assume that your time, your network is this time time evolving. So at each time step, the network is fixed. Uh, it, the structure is fixed. It's not annealed in the sense that you have a specific uh, adjacency matrix A at time T. But then as time steps changes, you have different adjacency matrices. So your, your temporal network is a sequence of adjacency matrices. Uh, and uh, you can actually define a new operator, uh, which is the infection propagator, uh, this matrix P, which, is, which contains both the time evolving topology of the network, A1, A2, A3, A3 et cetera, which is the structure of the network at different times, and also the infection parameters, mu, lambda. Uh, we call this infection propagator because basically under certain assumptions, uh, it propagates the infection because Pij is the probability that if you start with I infected at the, at the beginning of time, you will end up with J infected at the end of time. And we proved that uh, you can get the epidemic threshold by uh, solving this equation again, uh, involving the largest eigenvalue of the infection propagator. And if you're interested, there's also um, a code of my GitHub uh, that you can use to compute this thing. So um, again, I, I probably gonna skip the applications of this uh, because I want to talk a little bit about something else which is not uh, uh, only, only epidemic thresholds. We might go back at the, at the end if you're interested if there's time, go ahead. Thank you. So can you apply this methodology to say a disease like COVID where you have, you can think that in maybe a big city that indeed the network moves faster than the, the disease, but then you have small towns where the opposite is true. If you have this kind of heterogeneity, can you apply this or it will be too, too complex to be solved? So basically, uh, actually the topic, you, ah, yeah. I know, but it's, uh, so it's okay. So basically, yeah, the, the, actually the topic you are touching is that of metapopulation models, which uh, basically, I, I'm gonna talk about it in the end if there's time, uh, which basically means that you have a, in a city, in a patch, you have a homogeneous mixing, but then net, a network structure that connects different patches. Uh, the thing is that you can actually use these methods. Uh, I, I didn't use it on, on COVID, but for example, I used it on uh, livestock diseases in which you have uh, basically um, movements. Yeah, I'm not gonna, uh, I'm, I'm gonna skip this because of time and then we'll go back uh, if there's time, but I just wanted to, to show you. Uh, so this is a network of cattle movements from different, uh, all the premises involved in cattle market. This is, this was Italy. We also had other data sets. Um, so this is, a, you can think about it in the sense of the metapopulation because you have the premises in which the cattle mix homogeneously, but then they move a lot across the country and they move at a time scale that's actually comparable to many cattle diseases. Uh, so the, the, the quick answer is actually you can, but of course it depends on how you're framing the model and the, the simplifying assumptions that, uh, that you make, we can talk about it uh, more in detail if you're interested, of course. Um, so again, yeah, we're not, uh, I, I just want to, to change topic a bit, but then uh, because those, I had prepared two applications for actually computing the epidemic thresholds for public health purposes. Again, if there's time, we'll go back. Otherwise, if you're interested, we can talk later. But um, now I think I just don't wanna skip uh, a more like data, uh, driven part because I think it's very relevant. It's very relevant now with, the, let's say, the COVID revolution. Um, what I implicitly basically mixed on purpose up to now was the different types of networks that you can have contact networks and mobility networks. Contact networks is who is in contact with whom. It's really contact between people or between animals or between animals and people, but like A, uh, person A, person B can be face-to-face -face contacts, as we saw at the beginning with the hospital face-to-face -face proximity. It can be sexual contacts, uh, et cetera. 
Mobility networks instead tell you where people go and where people spend their time. And typically this network, they, have, they connect patches. So it can be catchment areas for airports, can be regions, departments, provinces, however you call them. Uh, and then you have either the number of people going daily from region A to region B, or how much time do people who are resident in region A spend daily or yearly in region B because of holidays, because of recurrent work, whatever. Um, or uh, you have just, as I said, like in, in the case of air travel, you have population flows. So how many passengers go from uh, JFK to uh, Amsterdam every day? And that's really a number of people going. So mobility networks, um, are very, very useful uh, in, uh, in epidemiology, and they are becoming ever more useful because, um, because the data to build them are becoming more widespread, more accurate. Uh, I think we can define, we can, let's say, categorize the different types of mobility data and mobility networks for epidemiology in three types. One are those that you use to study the spatial spread of a disease. In the case, for example, uh, of, uh, um, of an airline network here, that's the that's Zoom thing that's canceling, but basically you study pathogen importation and exportation. We will see an example of that. You can guess what, what the disease will be. But um, basically you are studying how uh, a disease go, goes from a place in the world to the rest of the world. Then you have other interesting data sets with study mixing, and it's basically this example that I told you, and we, we will see an example of that, but it's like, okay, I live in Paris. Um, how much time do I spend in close proximity with people from Lyon or from people from a, a neighboring area of Paris and where these things takes place? And finally, there are other networks which basically describe mobility in, in terms of exposure. And it's the early example of malaria that I made. Being uh, given that, for example, malaria uh, thrives in rural areas. So I have people living in the cities, but maybe for work or for um, family reasons, they spend some time in an area in the countryside with a high parasite prevalence. And so you can match these networks of mobility with maps of exposure to a risk of acquiring um, a disease. As, a, as, a, as an example of how you can use uh, mobility networks, and in this case, airline mobility networks, um, I will show you the work that we did on studying uh, the risk of uh, importing COVID from China, and we are talking about early 2020, February, March 2020, where there were no or few cases confirmed in Europe and in many places of the world. And we used this data basically to infer risk of importation. So this was the, this was the situation at that time. Here you have uh, the um, uh, number of cases uh, in each Chinese province. And basically you want to, you, you, you basically you just had two ingredients. One was this. Uh, and the other one was uh, passenger flows all over the world. And there was no other ingredient in the sense that very little was known about the epidemiology and the natural history of this new disease. So um, I, I'm gonna show the, the, you this, uh, um, this example because I'm, I'm, a real, uh, I'm a great fan of very simple and robust models because you can always build a huge stochastic model, uh, agent base, whatever, with so many parameters inside and do many stochastic runs. But in the end, if you have poor knowledge on the assumptions and the parameters that you're putting inside, uh, then the output will be very heavily dependent on the arbitrary assumptions that you made. Um, instead, when you have, uh, basically you are in a situation of quick response because uh, you know that this, um, this disease is gonna come and you want to assess which countries are likely to get it first and what is their risk of importing it and maybe cross it with other metrics like what's their preparedness to deal with incoming cases in terms of detection, isolations, et cetera. Uh, then you have to make very, very simple assumptions that hopefully are robust 
um, across tiny changes in the epidemiology of the diseases. Instead, if your model relies heavily on a very precise estimation of the serial interval of the disease or the generation times, which basically tells you the timing on how the disease is spread, if that uh, measure is not reliable, it's not gonna work well. So that being said, this is what we did. So we combined those cases and this network of air transportation. And we did this very simple calculation. So basically we defined this new network, PIJ, which basically the, is the probability of uh, that someone goes from a city I in China to a city J outside of China. So we discounted all within country uh, passenger flows. We transformed it from a network from a Chinese city to a Chinese country, uh, to a country in the world. And then basically we weighted each Chinese actually province by the reported case prevalence at, the, at that point. Because of course, if you have that many people come from city A, but there are a few cases there, maybe city B, which has a lower traffic to the, the place you are measuring importation to, uh, but has high prevalence, maybe you are more likely to receive a case from there. So you can see a very simple model uh, with just two ingredients and minimal assumptions, so just you know, some sums over the networks that sort of make sense. Uh, and with that, we measured the risk of importation uh, to Europe and to African countries. And we're talking about uh, late January, early February, where at that time, few, uh, like three or four cases, I think, were reported in Europe and no cases were reported to Africa. And the interesting thing is that the, the four countries for which we, um, we uh, estimated high importation risk in Europe were the ones who got the most severe first wave, uh, possibly because actually this high report, uh, estimated risk of importation was a signal of a silent importation cases that were not detected and kept, had kept coming in and then fueled the first wave. And uh, in Africa, uh, we, we estimated Egypt to be uh, at the highest risk of importation and indeed, indeed the first reported um, case of COVID-19 in Africa was indeed in Egypt. So again, to show you that uh, very simple models uh, sometimes are very useful from the epidemiological and public health point of view and I encourage to you to use uh, like as much simplicity as long as it makes sense uh, as possible. Um, uh, yeah, and one other thing that we did, uh, which I think is, uh, is interesting, is that with that very simple importation model, you could also estimate the uh, like, most likely origin of case importation from China. So you say, okay, I have a certain risk of importation from China, but it might come from Shanghai or it might come from Beijing. And also this is a relevant public health information if you're thinking about a country who has limited detection probability, limited uh, screening probability at an airport. And so they might focus screening on some uh, planes or some passengers that come from specific locations. So basically we defined an exposure vector for a, each country in the world, which basically tells me the risk of coming to a, of a case coming to a specific Chinese city. We clustered countries uh, according to this, these exposure vectors, and we could find different cl clusters around the world. For example, the, rest, the, um, the red cluster was likely to import from Beijing, Shanghai, or Zhejiang, uh, the purple cluster, Beijing and Guangdong, et cetera. So, Again, to show you how many things you can do with very simple model and with very few data, which in a context of a, an emerging disease, it's critical because basically you know nothing about the disease. And so building a very complex model, as I said, uh, it's very hard and likely to be overfitted in a sense. Um, I think that my last quick topic, if I have time, how am I going with time? Yeah, so maybe um, I have an hour and a half, right? So yeah, I have a little bit of time. I wanna talk about a little bit more mobile phone data uh, and how you can use them in epidemiology to build net mobility networks for epidemiology. Uh, because I think that 
uh, this is a very hot topic and if any of you guys uh, wants to work on epidemiology and on network epidemiology um, they're gonna probably uh, work with the mobile phone data at some point mobile phone data they, they are powerful because everybody has a mobile phone basically and so uh, you can think how powerful in terms of a source of human mobility they can be um, mobile phone data come in very different forms the most like the, 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 the standard way the first way in which they were used was in terms of CDR CDR are called detail records and basically your mobile phone uh, connects to a cell tower you know that so it's an antenna located somewhere in the in the vicinity and it exchanges data packets with the with this uh, antenna either when you make calls you do something sometimes also passively um, and basically you can use this data to uh, to to match every mobile phone to a specific cell tower which will give you the approximate location and then if this mobile phone moves you can have an individual track that you can aggregate then and build mobility flows or time spent i mean there's a whole science and art in extracting meaningful mobility information from mobile phone data that's actually not the, that's not easy and there's a lot of science on that but the raw data is simply where to which antenna a specific mobile phone is connected to. Uh, then, of course, you have more recent um, types of data which rely instead typically uh, on two technologies, GPS and Bluetooth. GPS is, is great because it can be at a higher um, resolution than the cell tower, especially in low density population areas where cell towers uh, are far apart because typically they're like they are close apart where there's a lot of traffic because they can't handle too many mobile phones, but in rural areas, they can be kilometers apart. Instead, the GPS uh, has, a, has a higher resolution. Bluetooth uh, basically can tell you when two mobile phones are in close proximity. So for example, many contact tracing apps uh, that uh, a lot has been talked about, they work on Bluetooth technology, uh, exactly that. So, but the, the point is that um, called detail records are great, especially in developing countries, because they have a, a high population representativeness and a higher penetration. Because for everything that's not CDR, you need a smartphone. So that's fine in Portugal. Uh, they might be less fine in Malawi. Uh, so again, it's it's a technology and it's a science of day of these data that's in continuous evolution and it's it's a fertile field. We can talk about it later in. in uh, uh, if, if you're interested, but there's really a lot of work now in, in, in infectious disease modeling that uses mobile phone data. And I just want to, to show you an example uh, of how to use this mobile phone data of a, of a, of a work that we recently did um, to study HIV in Namibia. So these are the mobility data that we, that we used. Uh, they come from CDR, so called detail records. And basically, you, di uh, you divide, uh, this is Namibia, you divide it in a hundred uh, or so, uh, they call constituencies, they are administrative divisions. And then using this mobile phone data, you measure uh, how much time those resident in constituency A spend in constituency B over a year, or even in their own constituency, right? Most of these is probably due to recurrent uh, work related travel, etc. No matter, you have one way to infer a resident location of a user, and then you look at how much time those residents spend in another place, and you build a nice network. We used it, as I said, for HIV. Uh, Namibia is one of the countries in southern Africa that has an endemic HIV um, an endemic HIV epidemic in the general population, meaning that uh, it's not just concentrated in, in some key populations like, uh, for example, in Europe, but 15% uh, of women now in Namibia live with HIV. I'm mentioning women because typically in those situations, uh, the prevalence in women is twice as high as in men because of the way uh, HIV is, uh, is transmitted. Um, but another, like this is, this is a high number, 
uh, amazing progress has been made in the last decades in Namibia and in general in Southern Africa to decrease the incidence of HIV. So this is the prevalence. Of course, when you have HIV, you have it for life. It's important to stop new infections, so incident infections. The problem is that uh, in incidence decreased amazingly in last decades, but now it's still like, it, it sort of stopped decreasing. It's 1% uh, yearly in young women. It seems low, but if you imagine that this is a disease you get for life, 1% of young women getting HIV every year, it's actually too much to achieve HIV elimination, which is the, the target that uh, UNAIDS, which is the UN organization for HIV has set to, to achieve uh, elimination by 2030, et cetera. Uh, so this is the starting point for a work. And, and basically our, our uh, working hypothesis was that mm, people has focused a lot on behavioral aspects. It's like, oh yeah, uh, basically you have high HIV incidence and high HIV prevalence uh, because people have many partners. Uh, and then we said, well, maybe, maybe it's not that, maybe it's that is where you have these partners. Uh, these are countries with low population density and high mobility. You have seasonal works, for example, people going to works in mines or for agriculture and spending months away from home. So maybe you, having, you know, having two partners in the same city or having two partners across the country, that's gonna change the, the evolution of the, of the epidemics, may, making it somehow more resilient. So we cross this mobility data with uh, sort of high resolution HIV prevalence data, and which we found to be very heterogeneous because I said, okay, 50% uh, of women uh, have HIV, are living with HIV. But if you look at the prevalence by constituency, it actually ranges from uh, close to 5% to almost 40%. There are some places in Namibia where 40% of women are, are living with HIV. If this uh, map were always the same color, then probably mo mobility wouldn't make mu much of a difference. But our hypothesis was, okay, if you move, you will change your risk of exposure to HIV if you go to places where the prevalence is higher than at home or lower than at home. So basically we defined three types of uh, ex risk exposure to HIV. One is local risk. So I live in constituency I, this is my constituency. And of, I, I don't have HIV, and I have a certain risk of being exposed to HIV given that there are some people who live with HIV. But then there's also mobility. Uh, so there are some people who are not resident of my constituency who come in and have HIV. Uh, there are, there's me going for some reasons to other places, etc. So you can see all the possible four flows of mobility of HIV infected and uninfected going in and out. And this defines two types of risks and dynamics of risk importation and exportation. You have, to, to this constituency, you have some risk importation due to the movements of those infected who come in and may infect the people who are resident here. You have a risk of importation due to an outgoing flow of people. So people from this constituency, they are not infected. They go somewhere, they get infected and then they come home. This basically creates a net inflow of risk importation. And the same constituency by the same but opposite mobility flows also can generate risk ex exportation. Uh, I don't want to get on all the details of these, uh, these calculations. I just wanted to put them in the slides, which so I don't know if later we circulate the slides. They are there, but just to show you that again, there's no huge stochastic uh, model with 20 parameters. It's very simple. Three types of data, demographics, so the number of uh, people living in a place, HIV prevalence, uh, which was uh, reconstructed from a, from a survey, and mobility data from mobile phones. And then with minimal assumptions, you basically uh, create some uh, quantities that build three a multi-layer risk networks with three layers. One is a trivial layer, which is local risk that has no links. And each node, basically it's a self loop. Each node uh, has a, a risk due to the fact that in the same place there are 
uh, infected and uninfected residents which can be exposed to HIV by means of the infected. And then you have other two layers, which are actual networks. One is the risk flows due to the movements of those infected with HIV, and, and another is uh, the movement of those who are not infected with HIV. Uh, and this is uh, basically what the networks look like. And once you have this, you can make uh, all sorts of points about it, which uh, is the first one is that actually those two uh, layers, they are numerically not irrelevant. We found out that 40% of the overall risk of being exposed to HIV uh, is actually due to mobility. And we argue that this, is, uh, this should be considered in stepping up HIV interventions because if you just, w one strategy that was uh, like very popular was hotspot targeting. So you go uh, with resources where HIV prevalence is the highest. So uh, basically you go there and you target prevention among those who are not, who don't, do not have HIV and you uh, try to put everybody who is living with HIV on treatment because uh, basically if you are treated for HIV uh, and treatment is working, not only you have uh, almost normal life expectancy, but you are not able to transmit HIV even, you, even uh, with unprotected sex. So uh, treatment is basically what, uh, an amazing way to stop HIV transmission. Um, but we argue that maybe going uh, to the highest prevalent places is not the whole story because if you look at, for example, here, here you have this node here is the capital. Actually prevalence there is around the national median. It's really not one of the highest places uh, in terms of prevalence, but it's a great risk exporter because a lot of people from all over the country go there to spend time. So clearly this node, due to mobility, not due to prevalence there, is a, a great risk spreader and should be taken in account when you, add, when you devise intervention. The, I think that my time is sort of expired. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll finish with that. I, you will see, you, you saw many references in the network, uh, in the network. I just say network all the time <laughs> in the presentation. But uh, here there are some, uh, some classics. So if you're interested in epidemic modeling in general, this is a book that I suggest, Epidemic Modeling on Networks. That's this great book and this review. And then, um, of course, I mean, I'm here for questions uh, during the conference or uh, anytime. So first, I want us all to thank the speaker. Thank you. And before ending, we still have space for one or two questions if you want to take it. Absolutely. Out. So if you want to ask some question, a good question at least. Maybe they are all wanting the coffee break now. <laughs> Since I am a computer scientist, a programmer, we know that you know, a programmer is just a machine that transforms caffeine in code, right? So, so what we'll do then, so uh, Jen will still be around, so please feel free to ask him questions. Absolutely. As long as you want, I will also make your slides available to everyone because they are okay. very interested with the formulas. And besides the slides, I will put, all the sessions will be recorded and you will have access to them okay. afterwards, okay? So I encourage you to see the sessions afterwards, to see points and to recontact us on Slack even the week after the conference, okay? So given that I, I stole you 10 minutes before, we'll start 10 minutes after. We'll start at 10 past 11, so you can still have your half an hour of deserved coffee break. Okay, so see you in half an hour. And thanks again. Thank Jen. you.